It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high-yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back. This is a uh, beautiful day in New York, a little chilly, but... It's bright and early. I'm in my office, and tonight's a big night. I have a webinar with Sprint in which I'm going to discuss an interesting case of clinical neuralgia. And I do have videos, tutorials on clinical neuralgia that will be on the ultrasound tutorial, and I'll try to post some of it as well on the Virtual Pain Fellowship page, which, by the way, if you haven't signed up for, I encourage you to do so. There's more and more interest, and I should have more content coming soon from physicians as well as possibly industry. And once again, all donated content will be for free on the site. The only thing that um, you might need to pay for at some point is if you want a membership going forwards. But for now, it's free for all current fellows as long as your program director validates you through the email process on the website. And you'll get access to my lectures and videos for now. It's uh, basically the same thing as the pain exam audio or lecture access, and it could be either for a year or for a month. In the end, you could purchase, but for now it's free. So I really think you should take advantage of it because a lot of you have training programs with interrupted lectures or didactics that you may not be able to attend. So I think this will try to fill in those gaps. Of course, it's not going to replace a real fellowship. And I, uh, I actually uh, have been working hard on creating some more online content for you. The courses that I'm creating are coming out soon, I hope. There's a bunch of them, so uh, I've been quite busy, and this whole pandemic thing gave me a little extra free time to move, move forward. In addition, I wanted to make you all aware of NICIP, NICIP's webinar series. They have another webinar coming up with Dr. Brian Durkin, Sudhir Diwan, and the webinar date is May 8th, and it's basically a fundraising, they call it fundraising uh, webinar for the foundation for the heroes of COVID. And they uh, want you to donate to the Iron Man Foundation. Chris Garibo, Ed Rubin, Ken Chapman. Brian Durkin and Sudhir Diwan will be there. It's at 5 p.m. May 20th, and you'll hear inspiring stories from the frontline heroes to, and help make a difference, and I'll try to have a link to this on the email that I hope to send out later today or this week. So those are some big announcements. The NICEP webinars have been fantastic. I also plan to release soon, I'm almost done editing it, a regenerative medicine spine course. It's gonna be probably an hour online course, maybe uh, 30 minutes of lecture with some questions so you can get some CMA credits. It's, it's not done yet. So that's coming out in addition to all this ultrasound content, which I've been working on very hard. I also am considering doing a webinar in the near future, in addition to the ultrasound online course that I've been teaching. So just check back with me frequently. Nothing is definite yet because I have a lot of uh, things going on and I'm just working as hard as I can to put out the content as quick as possible to help you guys for the boards as well as use this time to help build up your skill set so that you can come back to work even better than before if you're not working now or just improve your skills. So that being said, this episode is sort of for the fellows. It's going to be, it's, it's not just for the fellows, it's for all of us. It's going to be a keyword re review. I'm just going to go over some terms that I have from my various projects with um, terms that, ask, that are asked on the boards and terms that you'll probably at some point, most of them may be applicable in your practice, whether you're 
studying for the boards or not, I think you should, you should just pay attention because it's a good review for the rest of us. So in terms of the keywords, it's been a while since I've done a keyword review, but here goes. Uh, let's talk about the median nerve and entrapment. Okay, the pronator teres can trap the median nerve. It presents as pain on the volar forearm and there's discrete tenderness in the region of the pronator teres. Superficial radial nerves can be entrapped at the brachioradialis tendon, presenting as a paresthesia of the dorsal wrist and thumb without weakness. And by the way, believe it or not, this is something I've seen quite a bit in my practice, and I do believe there's a image, no, there definitely is an image on my ultrasound review of how to find the, the radial nerve underneath the brachioradialis. The ulnar nerve, we all know, gets entrapped at the cubital tunnel at the retinaculum, and it will present as pain in the ulnar distribution. There may be tenderness over the region of the ulnar nerve. The posterior interosseous branch of the radial nerve can be entrapped at the arch of the supinator muscle. This is called the arch of frosse. I hope I'm saying that right. And this presents as pain in the, in the, in the dorsal forearm. There's discrete tenderness over the brachioradialis muscle distal to the lateral epicondyle. Talking about other entrapments, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve can get entrapped at the inguinal ligament or fascia lata, and it can have numbness or burning pain in the anterior lateral thigh, okay, presenting as neuralgia parasthetica, correct? The saphenous nerve can be entrapped at the substartorial canal or hunter's canal and this will present as medial knee pain and anterior tibial pain. Suprascapular nerve can be entrapped at the suprascapular notch. It presents as posterior shoulder pain along the border of the trapezius muscle. The scapular notch, there's tenderness, pain with arm hyperabduction. The brachial plexus can be compressed at the thoracic outlet, known as thoracic outlet syndrome, of course. And this is the junction of the first rib and the brachial plexus. This presents with shoulder pain and supraclavicular tenderness, hand numbness, tingling, and pain exacerbated with spear throwing. When was the last time you threw a spear? I, it's been a while for me, I guess. I just I have that image of uh, the guy from Revenge of the Nerds throwing the spear. And if you haven't seen that part, you, you should definitely watch that. The axillary nerve can be entrapped in the quadrangular space. And I actually do have a picture of this for my review on the nerve blocks that may be applicable for peripheral neuromodulation because the axillary nerve is not something that I normally will inject for shoulder pain. However, I've been targeting it for neuromodulation, for peripheral neuromodulation, and I've definitely, definitely been having good results with that. So that's something you should check out, play with the ultrasound, try to find the nerve in the quadrangular space it's, uh, it's doable. It may not be so straightforward at times, but it, it's, uh, it's definitely possible and it will help your patients, especially if you're going to stimulate that nerve for a peripheral stim. Anyway, the axillary nerve entrapment can present as pain in the shoulder or upper arm, and there can be tenderness in the quadrangular space. Let's move on to, to cervical anatomy. And the vertebral artery usually enters the foramen at C6. It may also enter at higher levels such as C3. Sagittally, the artery runs a few millimeters ventral to the adjacent nerve root that's exiting. C7 nerve root starts at the level of C67. It provides sensation to the third digit and it's involved in the triceps deep tendon reflex. It innervates the tricep, wrist, and finger extensor muscles. And I'm talking about C7 in particular right now because this is a very common entrapment, right? The, the uh, cervical spine has uh, C6 is one of C7, C5. These are probably the most commonly affected nerve roots in the cervical spine. A big key point or keyword asked on the boards is the innervation of the C23 facet. And if you don't remember, it's innervated by the large third occipital nerve. This nerve is one of two median branches of C3 dorsal ramus. 
the joint is innervated to some degree by the C2 dorsal rami. The C2 dorsal ramus has five branches. The medial branch is also known as the greater occipital nerve. We all know that one. And the communicating branch between the dorsal branches of C1, C2, and C3 are implicated in cervical genic headaches. Still in the cervical spine, the distance between the ligamentum flavum and the dura is 1.5 to 2 millimeters at C7. This is because of the enlargement of the cervical spinal cord. Flexion of the cervical spine moves this region cephalad, resulting in a widening of the epidural space at C, at, excuse me, from to three to four millimeters at C7 to T1. This is really important because when I'm doing my cervical epidurals, which I don't like doing, but when I'm doing them, I'm asking the patient to maintain maximum flexion. And on that note, that's another reason why I don't like sedating patients for the cervical spine procedures because they may lose the ability to hold that position. They may lose tone. I also like the feedback that the patient can give me. Now, unfortunately, last week I had insanely, I shouldn't use the word insanely, a very anxious patient. And she would not allow me to do the procedure awake, and she really needed it. And I, I'm one of those people, I really, I'd rather do a transaortic celiac plexus block than a cervical epidural. I actually think it's, it's more forgiving, believe it or not. But anyway, this patient, um, she, she wound up getting the propofol, and we did the shot, and I really didn't like doing it. And it went fine, thank God, but it's just, it's just scary. God forbid they move. I once did a cervical epidural under sedation, and after I injected, the patient had tremors in her arms, um, and I thought that maybe I hit the cord or injured it, and this may be some sort of reaction to it. And after the propofol wore off, I realized the patient was fine, and I was thinking it might have been some sort of myoclonus, which is not commonly seen with propofol, but could be. So it's just something that if you're, if you're doing it, I, 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 I'm not a big fan. If the patient's very anxious, I prefer a mild benzo or even um, anything that will just get them mellowed out without moving and completely uh, following instructions and with it so that they won't be disinhibited. However, there are those few patients who do require to be completely out because they have severe anxiety disorders, as my patient did. This patient in particular wouldn't even do a trigger point awake. That's how anxious she was. So, we, we, you know, there are people who sedation is indicated for, and like everything else, risks, benefits. We're not technicians. Okay, guidelines are there for a reason. They're important, but at the end of the day, it's your license, it's your patient's life, and you need to do what's best for the patient as well as protect yourself. So that being said... I'm going, I'm going to wrap it up. I wanted to thank you all for supporting the podcast and now the video series. My web developer is creating the pain exam news page where there will be a feed of the podcast as well as relevant, up-to-date, interesting articles and information. If you want to donate to the Virtual Pain Fellowship, please do so. You'll, you'll be immortalized on the pain exam website. Uh, you'll get credit. Docs will have free access to your content. I'm not going to charge anyone for anything that's been donated. Uh, this is a service I'm trying to provide for the pain community, for the fellows who are probably stressed out right now. Their board exam has been postponed, as well as their jobs may be in question. And speaking of jobs, I was contacted by someone who is looking for pain physicians in their clinics. I'm going to have a link on the, on the newsletter um, and probably on the podcast show notes, probably the newsletter will be easier. So make sure you're subscribed to my newsletter. It could be an anesthesiologist or a PM&R or any type of interventional pain physician. Um, I don't know much about these jobs in particular, but I do have the people you need to talk to. I know they're in multiple states. So if you're looking, may, may be worth contacting them and seeing, seeing what they have to offer. And please uh, spread the word about the podcast. I recently had a very nice uh, conversation with Dr. Garibo, Dr. Dewan, Lax from ASIP, and they're, they're, they're a bunch of great people. And I think that um, when times get tough, you need to look at your societies, ASIP, ASRA, NANS, all these societies to um, help brush up on our skills as well as for support. Uh, what they did last week 
with getting with what Azra did with uh, that letter to um, CMS, which I, I read, I think, a week or two ago, really helped us out with the telemedicine. And these organizations are fighting for us. So I encourage you all to support them. Right now, going to the conferences is hard to do, but hopefully in the summer and fall, things will calm down and we will all be able to meet and continue to support and learn. And be sure to check out the Virtual Pain Fellowship, NICEPS webinars, as well as the upcoming webinars, which I will be announcing on my newsletter and future episodes of the podcast. Thanks for joining us and good luck. Tune in tonight to Sprint's webinar so you can see me talk about the clunial nerves. Take care. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate, and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced produced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.